Chapter Sixteen of Seventeen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Burchard, June two thousand nine. Seventeen by Booth Tarkington. Chapter Sixteen, The Shower. She continued to be thoughtful until after lunch, when, upon the sun's disappearance behind a fat cloud, Jane and the heavens exchanged dispositions for the time. The heavens darkened, and Jane brightened. She was in the front hall when the sunshine departed rather abruptly, and she jumped for joy, pointing to the open door. "'Look ye! Look ye there!' she called to her brother. Richly ornamented, he was descending the front stairs, his embellishments including freshly pressed white trousers, a new straw hat, unusual shoes, and a blasphemous tie. "'I'm going to get to sail my boat!' Jane shouted. "'It's going to rain!' "'It is not!' said William, irritated. It's not going to anything like rain. I suppose you think it ought to rain just to let you sail that chunk of wood. It's going to rain! It's going to rain! Jane made a little sing-song chant of it. It's going to rain! It gives Willie a pain! It's going to rain! It gives Willie a pain! It's going to... He interrupted her sternly. Look here! You're old enough to know better. I suppose you think there isn't anything as important in the world as you're getting the chance to sail that little boat. I suppose you think business and everything else has got to stop and get ruined, maybe, just to please you. As he spoke, he walked to an umbrella stand in the hall and deliberately took therefrom a bamboo walking stick of his father's. Indeed, his denunciation of Jane's selfishness about the weather was made partly to reassure himself and settle his nerves, strained by the unusual procedure he contemplated, and partly to divert Jane's attention. In the latter effort he was unsuccessful. Her eyes became strange and unbearable. She uttered a shriek. "'Willie's going to carry a cane!' "'You hush up!' he said fiercely, and hurried out through the front door. She followed him to the edge of the porch. She stood there while he made his way to the gate, and she continued to stand there as he went down the street, trying to swing the cane in an unaccustomed and unembarrassed manner. Jane made this difficult. "'Willie's got a cane!' she screamed. "'He's got Papa's cane!' Then, resuming her little chant, she began to sing. "'It's going to rain! Willie's got Papa's cane! It's going to rain! Willie's got Papa's cane!' She put all her voice into a final effort. Miss Pratt'll get wet if you don't take an umbrella! The attention of several chance pedestrians had been attracted, and the burning William, breaking into an agonized half trot, disappeared round the corner. Then Jane retired within the house, feeling that she had done her duty. It would be his own fault if he got wet. Rain was coming. Rain was in the feel of the air, and in Jane's hope. She was not disappointed. Mr. Genesis, so secure of fair weather in the morning, was proved by the afternoon to be a bad prophet. The fat cloud was succeeded by others. Fatter, a corpulent army assailed the vault of heaven, heavy outriders before a giant of evil complexion and devastating temper. An hour after William had left the house, the dust in the streets and all loose paper and rubbish outdoors rose suddenly to a considerable height and started for somewhere else. The trees had colic, Everything became as dark as winter twilight. Streaks of wildfire ran miles in a second, and somebody seemed to be ripping up sheets of copper and tin the size of farms. The rain came with a swish, then with a rattle, and then with a roar, while people listened at their garret doorways and marveled. Window panes turned to running water. It poured. Then it relented, dribbled, shook down a last few drops, and passed on to the countryside. Windows went up. Eaves and full gutters plashed and gurgled. Clearer light fell, then, in a moment, sunshine rushed upon shining green trees and green grass. Doors opened, and out came the children. Shouting, they ran to the flooded gutters. Here were rivers, lakes, and oceans for navigation. Easy pilotage, for the steersman had but to wade beside his craft and guide it with a twig. Jane's timely boat was one of the first to reach the water. Her mother had been kind and Jane, with shoes and stockings left behind her on the porch, was a happy sailor as she waded knee-deep along the brimming curbstones. At the corner below the house of the Baxters, the street was flooded clear across, and Jane's boat, following the current, proceeded gallantly onward here, sailed down the next block, and was thoughtlessly entering a sewer when she snatched it out of the water. Looking about her, she perceived a gutter which seemed even lovelier than the one she had followed. 
It was deeper and broader and perhaps a little browner, wherefore she launched her ship upon its dimpled bosom and explored it as far as the next sewer hole or portage. Thus the voyage continued for several blocks with only one accident, which might have happened to anybody. It was an accident in the nature of a fall, caused by the sliding of Jane's left foot on some slippery mud. This treacherous substance, covered with water, could not have been anticipated, and consequently Jane's emotions were those of indignation rather than of culpability. Upon rising, she debated whether or not she should return to her dwelling, inclining to the opinion that the authorities there would have taken the affirmative, but as she was wet not much above the waist, and the guilt lay all upon the mud, she decided that such an interruption of her journey would be a gross injustice to herself. Navigation was reopened. Presently, the boat wandered into a miniature whirlpool, grooved in a spiral and pleasant to see. Slowly the water went round and round, and so did the boat, without any assistance from Jane. Watching this movement thoughtfully, she brought forth from her drenched pocket some sodden whitish discs, recognizable as having been crackers, and began to eat them. Thus absorbed, she failed at first to notice the approach of two young people along the sidewalk. They were the entranced William and Miss Pratt and their appearance offered a suggestive contrast in relative humidity. In charming and tender-colored fabrics, fluffy and cool and summery, she was specklessly dry. Not a drop had touched even the pink parasol over her shoulder. Not one had fallen upon the tiny white doglet drowsing upon her arm. But William was wet. He was still more than merely damp, though they had evidently walked some distance since the rain had ceased to fall. His new hat was a mucilaginous ruin his dank coat sagged, his shapeless trousers flopped heavily, and his shoes gave forth marshy sounds as he walked. No brilliant analyst was needed to diagnose this case. Surely any observer must have said, Here is a dry young lady, and at her side walks a wet young gentleman who carries an umbrella in one hand and a walking-stick in the other. Obviously the young lady and gentleman were out for a stroll for which the stick was sufficient, and they were caught by the rain. Before any fell, however, he found her a place of shelter, such as a corner drug store, and then himself gallantly went forth into the storm for an umbrella. He went to the young lady's house, or to the house where she may be visiting, for if he had gone to his own he would have left his stick. It may be, too, that at his own his mother would have detained him, since he is still at the age when it is just possible sometimes for mothers to get their sons into the house when it rains. He returned with the umbrella to the corner drug store at probably about the time when the rain ceased to fall, because his extreme moistness makes necessary the deduction that he was out in all the rain that rained. But he does not seem to care. The fact was that William did not even know that he was wet. With his head sideways and his entranced eyes continuously upon the pretty face so near, his state was almost somnambulistic. Not conscious of his soggy garments or of the deluged streets, he floated upon a rosy cloud, incense about him, far away music enchanting his ears. If Jane had not recognized the modeling of his features, she might not have known them to be William's, for they had altered their grouping to produce an expression with which she was totally unfamiliar. To be explicit, she was unfamiliar with this expression in that place, that is to say, upon William, though she had seen something like it upon other people once or twice in church. William's thoughts might have seemed to her as queer as his expression, could she have known them. They were not very definite, however, taking the form of sweet, vague pictures of the future. These pictures were of married life, that is, married life as William conceived it for himself and Miss Pratt something strikingly different from that he had observed as led by his mother and father, or their friends and relatives. In his rapt mind he beheld Miss Pratt walking beside him through life, with her little parasol and her little dog, her exquisite face always lifted playfully toward his own, with admiration underneath the playfulness, and he heard her voice of silver always rippling baby talk throughout all the years to come. He saw her applauding his triumphs, though these remained indefinite in his mind and he was unable to foreshadow the business or profession which was to provide the amazing mansion, mainly conservatory, which he pictured as their home. Surrounded by flowers, and maintaining a private orchestra, he saw Miss Pratt and himself growing old together, attaining to such ages as thirty, and even thirty-five, still in perfect harmony, and always either dancing in the evenings or strolling hand in hand in the moonlight. Sometimes they would visit the nursery, where curly-headed, rosy cherubs played upon a white bear rug in the firelight. These were all boys and ready-made, the youngest being three years old and without a past. 
they would be beautiful children, happy with their luxurious toys on the bare rug, and they would never be seen in any part of the house except the nursery. Their deportment would be flawless and— Willie! The aviator struck a hole in the air. His heart misgave him. Then he came to earth, a sickening drop, and instantaneous. Willie! There was Jane, a figurine in a plastic state and altogether disgraceful. She came up out of the waters and stood before them with feet of clay, indeed, pedestaled upon the curbstone. Who is that curious child? said Miss Pratt, stopping. William shuddered. Was she calling you? Miss Pratt asked incredulously. Willie, I told you you'd better take an umbrella, said Jane, instead of Papa's cane, and she added triumphantly, Now you see. Moving forward, she seemed to have in mind a dreadful purpose. There was something about her that made William think she intended casually to accompany him and Miss Pratt. You go home, he commanded hoarsely. Miss Pratt uttered a little scream of surprise and recognition. "'It's your little sister!' she exclaimed, and then, reverting to her favorite playfulness of enunciation, "'Oor ickle sissa!' she exclaimed gaily as a translation. Jane misunderstood it. She thought Miss Pratt meant our little sister. "'Go home,' said William. "'Naughty, naughty!' said Miss Pratt, shaking her head. "'Me fraid oo's a naughty, naughty ickle durl, all dirty. Jane advanced. "'I wish you'd let me carry Floppet for you,' she said. Giving forth another gentle scream, Miss Pratt hopped prettily backward from Jane's extended hands. "'Oo, oo!' she cried chidingly. "'Mustn't touch. Pessish Floppet all so water-washed clean. Ickle Durly all muddy nassy. Ickle Durly must go home. Get all soap and water-washed clean like nice Ickle Sissa. Everybody will love oor Ickle Sissa den,' she concluded, turning to William. "'Tell oor Ickle Sissa must go home. Get soap water wash. Jane stared at Miss Pratt with fixed solemnity during the delivery of these admonitions, and it was to be seen that they made an impression upon her. Her mouth slowly opened, but she spake not. An extraordinary idea had just begun to make itself at home in her mind. It was an idea which had been hovering in the neighborhood of that domain ever since William's comments upon the conversation of Mr. Genesis in the morning. "'Go home,' repeated William. And then, as Jane stood motionless and inarticulate, transfixed by her idea, he said almost brokenly to his dainty companion, "'I don't know what you'll think of my mother. "'To let this child—' "'Miss Pratt laughed comfortingly as they started on again. "'Is it Mama's fault, foolish boy Baxter? "'Ickle Durleys will debt daddy. "'The profoundly mortified William glanced back over his shoulder, "'bestowing upon Jane a look in which bitterness was mingled with apprehension. "'But she remained where she was and did not follow. "'That was a little to be thankful for.' and he found some additional consolation in believing that Miss Pratt had not caught the frightful words, Papa's cane, at the beginning of the interview. He was encouraged to this belief by her presently taking from his hand the decoration in question, and examining it with tokens of pleasure. "'Oo pity walk tick she called it, with a tact he failed to suspect. And so he began to float upward again. Glamours enveloped him, and the earth fell away. He was alone in space, with Miss Pratt once more. End of chapter 16